Hello everyone. Since I believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins and his gift of eternal life at the age of 15, I have experienced literally thousands of good things from God. I completely identify with the worship leader, Matt Redman, when he wrote the second verse of the song, Bless the Lord. It says, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. Over the past 12 months, God has continued to be just the best father to me. Yes, this year has been unimaginably tough. Like you, I've lived with the constant threat of a deadly virus. I've spent months living under the strictest COVID-19 restrictions. Due to, co to, due to advanced prostate cancer, I've had to shield 193 days so far of going no further than our bins. I've not been able to do my job properly as sports chaplain to the Falcons Rugby Club, having had to keep away from staff and players at a time when people's jobs and professional sports very survival has been on the line. I've not hugged my own grown up kids or been able to kiss any of our nine grandchildren. And on top of this, I've lived most of the year with fatigue and bone pain due to the cancer fighting back against the treatments I receive. Now, none of us has the absolute right to say life is hard, but I feel as if at least I have some justification to declare that last year was unbelievably tough. Yet still I say, blessed be the name of the Lord. My good, good father has blessed me more than I can tell you. Out of his goodness and grace and because of his constant faithfulness, God has given me a huge number of good things. Not least that I'm still here and still standing. There is, however, one good gift that I'll spend the rest of this time telling you about. It's this. God has humbled me. What I hear you say, you're describing being humbled as a good gift from God. Yes, I am. You see, I came to realise even before the pandemic that my Heavenly Father was on my case, that he was being the master potter, as he is described in Isaiah 64, verse 8, and he was getting to work on the clay of my life. That verse says, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. Notice the loving setting of this phrase, you are Lord, our Father. But then note the image presented to us. He is the potter, the creator, the shaper, the musher. And we are the clay, the raw material, the messy lump of earth, the substance to be squidged. There are a number of reasons given to us in the Bible for why life gets tough. One of these is because God takes us through experiences to change us, to mould us, to make something beautiful, a Christ-like person out of us, mere dust. Now, those who know me well know that I'm a very long way from the finished article. So in this last year, God has applied pressure to my life in order to produce greater humility in me. And here are some of the reasons why. Firstly, I often see myself at the centre of my existence. I view the world with me at the centre of it. I need humility to live with Jesus at the centre, the sun around which I orbit and without whom I would not be alive. Then I'm proud. It's the basic fault line in us all, spoken of regularly in the Bible, that we're all pulled towards, towards being self-important. I need humility to live under the glory of Jesus, he is truly significant. Jesus is great. Jesus is glorious. Then I live as I've, I have rights. The right to comfort, the right to prosperity, the right to healing. I need humility to live as an undeserving child of God and the recipient of unmerited grace. The next one is a biggie. I'm partly shaped by our Western culture and I often think that I'm entitled. I deserve better as if I have an advantage as one of God's sons over the rest of people. 
I need the humility of Jesus to understand that even though I am so very precious to God and a co-heir with Christ, I have no inherent claim to privilege or title. Then I've lived much of my life as if I'm in charge. It simply isn't true. And I need the humility of Jesus to surrender to God's rule and reign. Lastly, I've swallowed often the message of our culture, which says, I'm unlimited. There's nothing I cannot be. A few weeks ago, I was reading about the great Kenyan runner, Eliud Kipchoge, the greatest distance runner of all time. His mantra is, no human being is limited. The humility of God shines a light on this lie. For all my huge potential as a man and as a son of God who has Jesus living in me, I am still profoundly restricted, constrained by a limited body and a broken world. God is the unlimited one. And the humility of Jesus makes me extraordinarily usable to him. In short, God has mushed me because I have such a long way to go to be like Jesus. Humility, you see, creates a servant heart. Humility fuels deep worship. Humility ultimately leads to stunning honour. These past months, we've all experienced a profound humbling. We've been stopped in our tracks, had our plans obstructed, repeatedly felt out of our depth, baffled, stumped, rattled, even flawed, unable to fall back on experience to get through as a human being, let alone as God's child. This year has been exhausting and caused us to feel pretty small. But this has been God's redemptive plan for this year, the locusts have eaten. To the question, why has God allowed the pandemic and all that comes with it? The answer, in some part, is to bring us to our knees in surrender. Surrender, not resignation, capitulation or giving in, but a fresh yielding to God and his sovereignty. A fresh working from the place of being a learner. A, a fresh flexibility in the face of God's control. Above all, a fresh wonder at God's grace. In 1 Peter 5 verse 6 we read, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. May I have the grace to accept the squidging now for the elevation that lies ahead. In the name of Jesus. Amen.